Good morning, everyone. Um, when they had the official title asked me, how do you get around procurement? And it's like, I can't answer that question. So I've tried to come up with uh, an approach to give a viewpoint of what procurement actually is and where it actually sits. Uh, the agenda I'm trying to run through in uh, some very complex areas that I mostly could do a two or three day workshop on in 30 minutes, so I may skip over some detail, have to have a chat later with you about various bits and bobs. So um, I want to run through what's commercial procurement and purchasing because I think it's fundamental. Uh, a quick review of where the law sits and what the law requires us to do. Uh, then look at how we classify innovation in government. I now have a model that I've been told is the model we're using, but it does keep changing. And we also have the uh, different types of approach to use public contract regulations um, in innovation projects. And I'm going to talk at a high level about some of them. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about um, something that happened last week. The minister finally announced the UK government innovation strategy around technology. Um, I would say that this covers transport data uh, in a very significant way, and I'm going to talk about a new approach that we've developed to support that innovation, uh, uh, in the government innovation strategy. So first bit, um, I work for Crown Commercial Services, and I, people say, well, do you do procurement, and what's purchasing? So to me, commercial, if you have a relationship with anyone, and money's involved, that's a commercial relationship. That's the way I look at it. Procurement is the process that the public sector has to go through to be compliant with law to allow us to buy stuff. I actually look at this as an exam paper. You set an exam paper to set questions, you answer the exam paper, and whoever gets the highest mark or marks over a certain threshold wins that exam paper. You can't reset an exam paper. If you do an October exam in 2015, you can't set that exam paper again. It's a different exam at a different point. But if you basically think procurement as exams and everything that goes around it, that's most probably a healthy mindset to have around it. And I then consider purchasing the process of placing an order within financial regulations. So if I basically say to a purchasing officer, can you please place an order for me? They'll say, is the contract in place? They'll then place the order. So that's my mindset, how the three things sit together. However, I'm going to talk about the procurement lens today. Everything we do is commercial, but I'm going to look through the procurement lens on how we go forward with things. Um, right, so in the UK, we're still a member of the EU at the moment. Um, we're covered by the EU Procurement Directive. In England, that was transcribing to your law via something called the um, Statutory Station Instrument uh, Procurement Regulations 2015. Um, this basically takes the European directive and just sticks it into UK law verbatim with a couple of options being exercised within it. The important point, though, is that we're a member of something called the World Trade Organization Government Procurement Agreement, or the GPA. We will remain a member of the GPA when we leave the EU. The way that we currently administrate GPA is actually through the EU procurement procedures we will still have to amend to the GPA procedures when we go forward, but the question is, it does give us a little bit more wriggle room in how we can actually draft our own procurement procedures. The only thing I will say is the GPA is due for update in 2022. The EU directives are due for 2024. I'll leave you to figure out what timetable I would expect to happen around the update of procurement rules in relationship to the GPA update and when the EU update actually takes place. Under the EU procedures, under EU procurement procedures, we have a number of procurement tools, or if you want to say exam processes that we can undertake, um, that are open, restrictive, competitive dialogue, direct purchasing system, I will use DPS, that's what it stands for, and we also have the negotiated procedure. Now, I could now spend the next hour and a half explaining each of these in minute detail and what they actually mean. Most of you are aware of, I would expect, open and restricted procedures. Can I have a quick show of hands in the room who's actually responded to an open or restricted tender at some point in the past? Who's actually drafted a tender specification for an open or restricted process? So we're pretty aware that it's an exam, you set it, you give responses, we mark it, we award it there's some clarification of what do you actually mean by this, what do you mean by that, what you're asking. There's particular timelines around this. Both those two procedures award something called a framework, 
That framework allows you to then do a further call for competition. Some frameworks allow you to do direct award. That's all I'm going to say on them for the moment. The more interesting ones are around competitive dialogue, negotiated design competitions, and also dynamic purchasing. We'll come on to them when we actually get to the innovation space. Um, some of the details around the rules, um, all the concept of public procurement is basically to avoid corruption and collusion is one of the fundamental areas. One of these areas is basically we have to have equal treatment for all suppliers. So if my favourite friend Bob, he has a company, I can't award a contract unless it's gone through a compliant process. We can treat suppliers all equally bad, but as long as we treat them equally, okay, that is fundamentally the core of the approach that we have to take. Non-discrimination, all suppliers are equal. This does create problems uh, around the ability to do things locally in some instances. So uh, an example I was given yesterday, uh, a French organisation in France putting in a uh, contract to supply labour requested that all workers have to speak French from a health and safety position. This was found to be discriminatory because you may have Polish builders. So if there was, it was then redrafted to say they had the understanding of the basic level of French to understate the health and safety, that was found to be compliant. So you have to be balanced within the approach that you take. But it has to mean that any party, even under GPA, has to have the ability to supply goods and services. So you're looking at a global market, not a local market. The other thing that makes sense silly as well, as we move towards a position where we're negotiating free trade agreements, procurement forms part of those free trade agreements. So the access to your market, special drawing rights, etc., building construction, will be classed as a trade commodity globally in the approach that's actually taken within the governance of the GPA. So say, for example, China market may open up to us in ways what's not currently open, but we'll have to reciprocate within our own agreements to allow those markets to be accessible for procurement. So as I say, this is a global entity, not a local entity. Transparency. We publish notices to say, hello, we're doing something. Would you like to bid? We just don't stick it under the sofa and hope no one knows about it. Always look for ex ante notices, because that's when we're doing stuff saying, we're not too sure, but we're going to let you know, and you can challenge us. Uh, proportionality. It's got to be in a way that it's fair to all parties. If we basically say that you have to have £200 billion pound turnover, and there's only one company in the world that can do that, then it's not fair to everybody. So effectively, it's proportional to what is the risk and what's the entity. Um, the objectives are quite simple. We want to be open and fair, and we don't want corruption. Okay. Um, we want to deliver value for public money, we're all taxpayers, we want the money to go as far as we want. Uh, and also we want to support policy agendas. Um, there's a difference in Scottish procurement, is that they've gone very much more around, they want to enable policy through how procurement's delivered. We are going down that path of the Social Value Act being extended to goods, services and works as well. Um, right, define the innovation model. Now, this was thrown at me four days ago, and I had a completely different innovation model that I had been working with. So I'm going to say I agree with what's on the screen. I haven't fully learned it yet. So I'm going to be perfect on with you. I'm sure there's going to be lots of innovation models today. But effectively, what we've tried to do with this is basically position where we think different types of innovation takes place. Um, at the top box, we've got radical innovation that is mostly what most people think innovation actually is. And then at the bottom, we've got incremental that's like, um, can we put LED lights in rather than light bulbs? It's, it's a progression of technology rather than a suddenly, oh, lampposts, they're new. I've never seen them before. Um, disruptive innovation, um, it's where you apply different sets from different processes, and the architectural is... Um, from a different market. I may have got those two mixed up, but I do apologise on that. But that's the model that was announced. That's the model we're working to. So hopefully that gives you a baseline that you can actually consider what type of innovation you're trying to drive, how that innovation is trying to go forward, and where you actually position your innovation. Because I think it then determines an approach to how you have to approach the procurement process and also how you have to approach the market and what you're trying to drive from it. So... 
Um, I was a number of uh, procurement colleagues the last couple of days and asked them what's their favourite question they've been asked about innovation. And we came up with a list of what was as shown. So um, what type of innovation? I have a model. I can answer that one now. Uh, where's innovation coming from? So what's, why do we need innovation? What are we trying to do here? Has it been done before? Do we have capacity in-house to deliver the innovation? So is it changing light bulbs? We've got electricians. I'm sure we could do that. But if we want to make the light bulbs for the LEDs ourselves, hopefully we need to buy them in. So it's trying to get the right balance of what we're trying to do. But all these usually end up on the procurement uh, desk. And these are the questions we need to ask to make sure that the commercial relationship is going to be correct going forward and understanding what you're actually trying to buy. The biggest problem we always have is like, we want to buy something, but we don't know what. But we can help you with that. So the approach I think we need to take is that procurement's usually at the end of the process. You've done some discovery work. You've decided upon whom you like to supply that innovation to you. So you go to procurement and say, I want to spend some of my budget and money. Uh, can I please have Bob come and do some work for us? Um, I think we need to reverse that. You have to put procurement at the front end of the project. Procurement should be the people doing the discovery with you. Procurement should be the people that are actually talking to you, saying, well, what are you trying to achieve here? What is the innovation? Now, I do understand that different organisations have different ca capabilities and different approaches to where people sit. But going back to the first thing I said between commercial procurement and purchasing, if your procurement team's more a purchasing team, they might have capability. You need to get the capability so that you can actually deliver up front. So you can actually engage in the market in a way that means that everyone's treated fairly openly and the process is from the beginning fair. Um, one of the stories that was told to me yesterday was under a particular innovation, someone's brought in to do £25,000 worth of work. Two years later, that raised to 3.7 million, and there'd been no governance around it because they've been doing it in lumps of 25,000 on a weekly basis. How that didn't get caught out, I have no idea. But effectively, that's, gonna get, that's not going to be healthy for your job because effectively, governance has to be in place and spending that money and not going through a procurement opens up every other partly up to liability within that space. Right, so. What procurement tools are available and how can this work? Now, just to explain very quickly, um, we know that buildings have been designed on international competitions for the last 100, 200 years. I believe Crystal Palace was actually designed and then awarded, and that was through for architectural design. You can take the same approach to innovation. I know that Edinburgh City Council have actually gone down the path of asking, we've got a problem, please solve it. And they've done it through effectively a design competition. Under the procurement rules, under the negotiated procedure, if there's been a complete design competition that's taken place, you can award directly without any further call for competition. Okay? It exists within the regulations. It has done since 2004. I didn't have a chance to go back to 1994, but it's been there for over 15 years. But the amount of people, or the risk of the procurement people to actually undertake that approach has been very limited in the uh, positioning of that. But we do have the thing. So you basically say, we don't know what we want. Please tell us. You can just run an open, fair design competition, get people to come back. If you can then score it in a proportional way and it's found to be compliant and it's been transparent, that can be awarded directly through a negotiated procedure for that design. Uh, innovation partnership. Lorraine's already mentioned how this works. The way I look at this, it's basically trying to do something you've not done before, but you've got an idea of what you're trying to do, and actually you then basically take something that doesn't exist in the market to becoming a product within the market, is the way that I look at it. Goods or services, thing. But effectively, there's something called innovation partnership. You basically go through a, I use the term beauty contest, to allow them to actually identify what they can do for you. You work with them, you design as you go along, and then you then get to point. But it's for new things that don't exist. So if someone turned around and said, I want to buy a toaster, the answer is no, toasters already exist. If I want to buy something that makes bread and then toasts it as it's baked, that may not exist. So therefore, that may be a, an innovation partnership to draw on something that could be the innovation of toast. 
I'm not too sure. I may be hungry. I'll stop now. <laughs> okay. um, so innovation partnerships do exist in a way to actually deliver these type of processes. <coughs> the next bit is competitive dialogue. Now, um, I know from too many presentations ago, when they built HS2, HS1 sorry, down in Kent, they were also widening the M20. The M20, they actually put a load of scaffolding up and widened the viaducts across. When they built building HS1, they flew the bridges out across the Midway Viaduct, met in the middle, and there was no, very little scaffolding in place. Okay. That's a different approach to actually deliver the same bridge. Okay? So what competitive dialogue allows to do? So one example was the extension to the M74 in Scotland. It's, it was the, it's the south bit of the M74, or it's the, southern, it's the south bypass for Glasgow, is the best way to look at it. Um, they didn't know about the ground conditions. They didn't know about the architectural requirements. They didn't know about the planning permission. What competitive dialogues allow you to do is actually work through a series of questions and processes until you get to agreed specification with each of the suppliers that could meet your, what would meet your requirements. Then at that point, you stop the discussion and you go ask them to go away and price up what their costs are and then you compare those things together. So if you know that you need a particular type of innovation, it could be a competitive dialogue. Is the approach to get to a specification that fulfills those innovation requirements could be undertaken to actually drive forward, depending upon the innovation you're trying to drive forward. Okay. So that's another tool that sits within the recurrent tool set that it gives you an option depending upon the innovation you're trying to drive. Now, the third one down here, I'm just bringing this in very quickly because I didn't cover it. If you don't have in-house resources to actually understand what the innovation you're trying to drive, it may be easier to hire someone in to do those discussions before you even go to market. Okay, so someone working for you, it could be pre-market engagement in a particular way, but it's you having a resource that can actually understand and understand the market. It's bring an expert, consultant. You know, that is a good way to understand what you actually <coughs> want to achieve with what your ideas of innovation could be. Okay, there's easier processes to get these, and I'll just mention them very quickly in the round. Right, go and jump forward, and then things. So, as I said, um, the Minister for DCMS uh, Technology Week last week launched the Government um, Innovation Strategy for Technology. Um, is it a thrilling read? Will you fall asleep at bedtime? It has some good points in it. Um, it's a welcome step forward, is the best way to put it. It's been developed over the last 18 months, taken multiple stakeholders in central government, but it does lay out where funds sit and so on and so forth. Now, what Crown Commercial Services has been working on is something called a dynamic purchasing system. I'll just move for uh, slides to try and do what we started off calling a genesis innovation. So I'm just going to move forward. So it's basically trying to create a way. So say you've done an innovation partnership and you want to sell that to other partners, partners, we now have a dynamic purchasing system that allows you to have a tool to undertake a procurement exercise to allow other people to buy it in a way that's compatible with public procurement laws. So um, it is aimed at the technology space. It's not aimed at roadworks. Um, but it doesn't mean that we couldn't adopt a similar process for other goods and services or sectors going forward. But as we transport data, it does fall into technology in my space. So um, at the bottom, we have Innovate UK, Catalyst, um, DOS. These are is our uh, digital outcomes and specialisms um, framework. So we may actually say we want to build something in-house. We do the innovation in-house. We digitize something. We say, this is a really good thing. We want to be able to provide that to other government departments. Currently, there's no way of doing that. Because effectively, it's not. you would have to go through a competition with everybody else in available with common goods and services. But the market may have not developed to that point. So what we're used to is the mature market at one end, and these are things like normal frameworks, our normal commercial agreements. At this end, you've got the innovation. How do you scale that innovation? We use the term Genesis Innovation, and it's based to scale it to a particular thing. Now, the areas that we actually have covered within the uh, DPS, and I'll explain a little bit about DPS in a second, are listed above. Under transport, and I didn't have this yesterday, so do bear with us for one moment. Um, it covers 
uh, on-demand transport, autonomous vehicles, and I can't read my writing, uh, commercial uh, UAV drones. But also AI could apply within this space as well, around the data, so on and so forth. Um, I'll move on to the next slide and see if that helps. So what is Spark? Um, I could read out to you, but I'm sure you can all read, uh, and the slides are there. Um, as I say, to me, it's basically to try and scale where we actually have innovation we want to use across government or wider public sector. Okay. I just want to make sure. So what we're trying to do is basically provide common aims and basically things. Under the IP, we actually had a long discussion with the lawyers that we license IP in this rather than own it. So if the IP is being created from an innovation process, and there's some bits around this, this is a license to use that IP within the scaling process. Um, and that was addressed. There was a lot of discussion around where we want to sit. From a procurement perspective, it's always a cross-benefit position. What do you want to pay for something and what do you actually want? We always suggest you have a license to allow you to use and scale appropriately. That is making the most cost-effective position. No amount of IP that's never actually commercialised is so large, it's actually mostly not worth the benefit unless you know there's other things you're going to build on top of that as part of a product based. Um, naturally, it supports government policies around SMEs um, because it mostly will be the SMEs can scale quite quickly in this space. Um, so, what, we, what this one's aimed at is to understand where things actually sit and where, thing, where other things don't sit together. So effectively, um, these are a number of our different frameworks. Um, and it's just basically tried a comparison to understand where Spark may sit into those positionings and what have you. So I could ramble on, but you're going to get the slides later. Uh, I'm more than happy to discuss it in the panel. Uh, there's the contact details, I'm sure you'll get the pack, but thank you. Um, I'm sure there will be a load more questions, but um, we've got a couple in already. It's a bit difficult for me to read up there. But um, if we negotiate individual agreements under WTO rules, can they be different, or are they all ruled by GPA? Right, so... Um, so we're talking about um, uh, trade agreements. So each trade agreement is actually different. So usually under a WTO accession agreement, you have something called a special drawing right. That special drawing right basically identifies where you're going to allow access to a particular market. Um, so as part of the negotiation, you will decide, right, we are going to pay any, oh, sorry, any building uh, process under... <laughs> any, any building process uh, under um, 50 million in a particular market will be open in the UK and you will open your construction industry up maybe to similar or you will say that we exclude timber buildings but we will include uh, any building that's on timber. So effectively each of the agreements can have variations but you have to look at each of the uh, GPA agreements to actually understand what is in scope and what isn't out of scope. Um, but it is country by country Pacific. The next question is for yourself as well. What are the rules around publicising uh, innovation partnerships to ensure that all relevant interested parties have an opportunity to be considered for involvement? Okay, under the transparency obligations, uh, there are a series of what we call OG notices. Um, for an innovation partnership, you would publish a contract notice. You may even publish a, a PIN notice as well, what's a prior information notice. Um, at the moment, we use something called any, any contract value over... 100,000 ish in central government and 140, 150,000 uh, wider public sector, I should know those numbers but I've forgotten them, um, are subject to notification. There's also something called a disaggregation amount. So if I want to buy ice creams 
and I'm going to spend more than £25,000 a year in central government on ice cream over a four-year period. I have to advertise the fact that I want ice cream on a hot day. Um, if it's, uh, I'm only going to spend £10,000 per year, then most people wouldn't need to advertise the fact I need to buy ice cream. Um, so um, the notices are publicised in a way uh, via the official journal of the European Union. There's a site called TED. Um, as one of the resources to search whether or not innovation has been done before, you should be doing a search on TED. For quite simply, you can find out whether or not in a European market and also a global market whether or not that type of innovation has been undertaken. Um, when, if, but we leave EU, we will continue to have that requirement under GPA. Um, our approach will be to transfer to a platform that has been developed and amounts called Find the Tender Service FTS, uh, what be the equivalent to the OJU is TED for us at the moment. 